For the past quarter century, the world has been marked by an enormous amount of economic instability. At the end of the 90s, we saw crises in Korea, Thailand, Indonesia, Russia. Shortly thereafter, we saw crises in Brazil, Argentina. In fact, over the last 30 years, there have been crises in more than 100 countries. It's more unusual for a country not to have had a crisis than to have had a crisis. These crises have had an enormous toll on the people living in these countries. In this talk today, what I want to do is talk about what are the causes of those crises, what are the consequences of the crises, and what can be done about it. But the crises themselves are the tip of an iceberg, a symptom of something else, something more fundamental, wrong with the global financial system, the global economy. As another manifestation of that something is wrong is the fact that money is flowing from the less developed countries to the more developed countries. It's like water flowing uphill. One would have thought that the rich countries would be sending money to the poor countries, but just the opposite has been happening for the last several years. And while money is flowing from the developed, developing countries to the developed, risk is flowing the other way. The rich countries are in a better position to absorb the enormous risk of interest rate and exchange rate volatility, volatility and global economy, and yet the poor countries are forced to bear the consequences. This is surprising given the fact that Wall Street and financial markets all over the world pride themselves on their ability to slice and dice risk. All kinds of new risk products, derivatives have come up, and yet it is still the case that developing countries bear the enormous burden of risk and volatility. The consequences of this risk and volatility, of these crises, are enormous, both for the developed and the developing world. Europe has seen the consequence as the exchange rates fluctuated, discouraged investment, Europe has found the value of the euro go from below a dollar to the euro to up to a dollar thirty to the euro. At those high exchange rates, it's very hard for Europe to export goods. No matter what increase in productivity its firms were able to manage, no matter how hard its workers work, with exchange rates like that, it's hard to compete. But as difficult as the problems are for Europe and for the advanced industrial countries, matters are far worse for the developing world. When the economy suffers as a result of a high exchange rate and a volatility, at least people in Europe have strong safety nets. At least people in Europe have, many of them at least, have bank accounts. Uh, there's unemployment insurance. There's something to fall back on. In the developing world, Governments are too poor. If they provide a safety net, it's very meager. Money spent on the safety net is money taken away from development, so necessary for their growth to help them move out of poverty. What they've gained in the short run, while capital flowed into the country, is lost as the economy plummets. And a recession puts them back years in their strategy for economic growth and reduction of poverty. I saw this firsthand in the 90s when I visited Indonesia, Thailand, and Korea in the midst of their great crises uh, of those years. These countries were countries that had grown enormously during the preceding 30 years, the fastest growth that one had seen anywhere in the world. They had been growing at 5, 6, 7%. Not only were there growth enormous, the fruits of that growth were widely shared, so poverty had come down, literacy up, health standards were up. These were what we thought of as real success cases. Not only were they successful in growth, but they had voided much of the volatility that other countries had experienced. Other countries affected by crises, too, had not had a single year of downturn, and two had only one year of downturn in a span of 30 years. 
So if you looked at what, uh, they, uh, what they had done, it was an enormous success. And yet, when you saw the consequences, it was devastating. People who had migrated from the rural areas and searched for better jobs, found better jobs and incomes gone up, had to go back to the rural sector. As they went back to the rural sector in Thailand, for instance, wages in the rural sector fell enormously. In the case of Indonesia and the central island of Java, unemployment reached over 40 percent. In the Great Depression in Europe and the United States in the 30s, unemployment reached 25, 30 percent, but never levels of like 40 percent. You could feel, you could see what the devastation, the economic devastation. In Korea, people took their, their gold rings and jewelry, brought it down to the central, to the government, turned it over because they wanted to help their country recover. It was an enormous manifestation of, of solidarity of the people of Korea. People were wandering, men were wandering in the parks because they didn't want to go home and tell their wives that they'd lost their jobs. It was, it was an event of enormous consequence. The question is, what caused, what causes these crises and what can be done about it? As the countries of East Asia emerged from the crisis, the Prime Minister of Thailand talked about the class of 97, uh, countries that had learned the hard way the lessons of economic instability. They'd learned the lessons of mistrust in some ways of Western financial markets. Money had flowed in, then all of a sudden flowed out, leaving them, their economy, in, in, in an absolute mess. The question is, what were the underlying causes? Of course there were many. Any, any event of this magnitude has many, many causes. Countries didn't manage their economy perfectly. Volatility in international markets played an important role. But when you see country after country facing a crisis, when you see countries that had been so successful in managing their economy also fall prey to these enormous problems, you have to ask, is there something wrong with the overall global financial system and the way it's been managed? And the answer is, I believe, yes. Well, what were the underlying forces that, led to the, that lead to these problems in East Asia in the late 90s and Latin America in the early days of this decade? And today, all over the world, an enormous amount of volatility and exchange rates. One can look at the causes both in the short run and in the long run. In the short run, there's no doubt that the most important cause of global financial instability today are the global imbalances, the most important global imbalance being caused by the United States. The United States has been running a huge trade deficit. In effect, the United States has been buying more from abroad than it is selling. It is borrowing from abroad. Here you have the world's richest country not able to live within its means, borrowing between two and three billion dollars a day from countries that are much poorer. At the same time, of course, it's lecturing to other countries that they need to live within their means. But if the richest country in the world can't live within its means, how can you expect countries that are so much poorer to face up to reality? What is the cause of America's problem? Well, we can again look at the short-run problem, and then a little later I'm going to talk about the long-run problem. The short-run problem is quite clear. The U.S. government cut its taxes well beyond its ability to afford it. It cut the taxes for the richest people in the richest country in the world. The result is the U.S. government had a surplus 
government revenue over expenditures of 2% of GDP, of its total income, per year, when President Bush became the president. He quickly turned that around, first into a 3% and then into a 5% of deficit of GDP. Since then, growth and changes have still left the U.S. economy with a 3 to 4% deficit of GDP. When the United States is not able to, to finance its own government expenditures, it has to borrow. But it can either borrow from its own citizens or borrow from abroad. But here's the second problem. America, the American citizens, are not willing to save. In fact, last year for the first time and since the Great Depression, America as a whole, the country as a whole, consumed more than it made. Savings rate, household savings rates became negative. So with American citizens not saving, the only alternative was to borrow abroad. And that's why you wound up with this huge fiscal deficit, this huge trade deficit. And these problems of what are called the twin deficits, the fiscal deficits lead to trade deficits, we've seen over and over again in the history of economies. It's a very natural phenomena. If the government has to borrow from abroad, and if its citizens aren't going to have to borrow, and if its citizens aren't going to save, it has to borrow from abroad, and that leads to the trade deficit. And that's what we've seen going on today. Why does that lead to instability? Well, the reason is pretty clear. With the United States borrowing seven, eight hundred billion dollars a year, the question is, at some point, when will people say that's enough? They will stop lending to the United States. The question then is, what will happen? There is an enormous amount of uncertainty. And this uncertainty is what feeds in to an instability that we've seen. Of course, there are fluctuations on a year-to-year -year basis. The United States, for instance, last year had a, what might be called a partial tax amnesty. It said, companies, if you bring your profits back into the United States in the next year, we'll give you a big discount rather than paying the normal 30 plus, 30% plus in taxes, you can get away with a little bit more than 5% taxes. And that meant money flowed into the United States, corporate profits, huge amounts of repatriation, in a sense, a really unfair trade, trade action. But that strengthened the U.S. exchange rate, strengthened, made the dollar stronger for just a short period of time. And now we are in a, again a process of seeing a weaker dollar. So this is the the, the short run, the, the major source of instability in the global economy today. Of course, the United States blames others. It says the real problem is not what it's doing, but China. But we have to look at these numbers in perspective. China has a very large trade surplus with the United States. But that's a, what's called a bilateral trade surplus. What you need to do is look not at the trade surplus of China with the United States, but look at its multilateral trade position. Looking at it buys more oil from the, from, from the Middle East, it sells more to the United States. How does it all balance out? When the United States first brought these charges against China, China's trade surplus was very small. It was under $30 billion. And in fact, if you looked at the numbers more carefully, there were some problems of under-invoicing and over-invoicing of, of exports and imports, the result of which was that if you looked at the numbers more carefully, it wasn't even clear that they had any significant trade surplus from a multilateral point of view at all. There was no way that you can blame China when its trade surplus is 30 billion and the United States trade deficit is 600 billion to say that the China is the source of global imbalances. Now since then, China has continued to grow and it's continued to manage its growth in exports that are far faster than its growth of imports. And so China's trade, trade 
surplus today is larger than it was when these allegations were first brought. And I think in all fairness, one can say that today, China is becoming a more significant part of the problem than it was two or three years ago. But still, when you look at the overall magnitude, the seven, eight hundred billion dollars of trade deficit on the United States and the trade surpluses on the part of China and Japan and other countries, it is clear that the major source of global imbalance is the United States. And it's also clear that it is the major source of global financial instability. And so when you have the world's only superpower, the country that should be the leader setting the role model in the position of actually fiscal and economic irresponsibility, it is not a surprise at all that the world faces such instability. Part of the reason, of course, is that the United States can get away with it. If this were a smaller country, if the United States were a smaller country, it would be punished by the markets already. They would not let it get away with this kind of borrowing over and over and over again. The United States has moved in the span of 20 years from the world's largest creditor to the largest debtor. And it's precisely because people are beginning to get worried, ask the question, is this sustainable, that there is such uncertainty in global financial markets today. My predecessor as chief economist, the president head of the Council of Economic Advisors, once said that that which is not sustainable won't be sustained. And I believe he's right. The United States trade deficit is not sustainable. Its borrowing from abroad is not sustainable. And it is right for the worry world to be worried. What will happen? Will it unravel in a short period of time in a crisis or more gradually with a gradual weakening of the dollar, a strengthening euro, problems facing euro as Europe tries to export? It is not clear at this juncture. But what is clear is the kinds of economic imbalances which have characterized the world, the kind of economic policies which the United States has pursued over the last five years are not sustainable and have had enormous cost to the world economy. The cost of global instability for countries in the developing world is enormous. When the United States, in a period in which again, uh, again it paid less attention to, to pursuing good economic policies in the late, in the late 70s, let itself, let itself face very high inflation, turned around and said, we have to do something about it. Under chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, Paul Volcker, it raised interest rates to very high levels, to unprecedented levels. Interest rates rose to numbers in excess of 20%. When it did that, it paid very little attention to the global economic consequences. Of course, with the United States in the center of the global economy, it should and needs to pay attention to these global economic consequences. And I'll come back to this theme in a few minutes. The theme is that in a world of globalization, what the major countries do, and in particular what the United States does, has global reverberations. But unfortunately, when it comes to making decisions, it focuses on its own consequences. It doesn't focus on the consequence for the global economy. And so, just as it was running its huge deficits under President Bush, it paid little attention to the consequences for global economic instability, the consequences to Europe of a strengthening exchange rate, the consequences of instability, so too in the late 70s, it paid little attention when it started raising interest rates. Latin America had borrowed enormously, mainly from the United States and from other countries, 
during the 70s to avoid the enormous economic downturn that the high oil prices had inflicted on much of the rest of the world at that time. And in the 70s, Latin America had avoided um, the major downturn that so many other countries had faced. It had borrowed, not a, outrageously, but it had become in debt. It was a level of debt that it could manage, so long as interest rates remained at moderate levels. No one had anticipated interest rates rising to levels of 15 or 20 percent. And when they did, the debt became unsustainable. Well-functioning capital markets would have put the burden of the risk of these interest rate fluctuations or exchange rate fluctuations on the advanced industrial countries and the countries that could afford it much more easily. But global financial markets do not work well. And the burden was paced, placed on Latin America. The result was that country after country could not meet their debt obligations. They went bankrupt, they went, they went into default, and they resulted what has been called the lost decade. There was no way of dealing adequately with the, with the default. Countries started to send money back to the United States, to Washington, to repay the debts. Again, the flow of money went from the poor to the rich. The growth was slowed down, and poverty increased. For virtually a decade, Latin America stagnated. This is an example of the consequences of the failure of the current system where risk is imposed on the poorest countries of the world. I saw another example and a few years ago I was visiting Moldova. Moldova is one of the former Soviet Union republics had been one of the more prosperous of the republics, mainly agricultural country. But since the end of communism, fall of the Berlin Wall, becoming independent, it has had an enormously difficult time. The transition from communism to a market economy was supposed to bring unprecedented prosperity. Their incomes were supposed to soar. Instead, their incomes fell. Their incomes have fallen by 70 percent, and with that, the revenue of the government. But almost three-fourths of the income of the government was being used to service the debt. So while the government revenue had shrunk, most of the government revenue, three-fourths, were being sent abroad to service the foreign debt. You can ask, how could that happen? when a few short years earlier, Moldova had, had almost no debt. And the answer again comes from the fact that Moldova was forced to bear the risk of exchange rate fluctuations. It bore the cost of this enormous international instability. It had borrowed, and the vice of others, it had borrowed not in its own, exchange, in its own currency, but in hard currencies and currencies uh, euro or dollars or currencies linked to the ruble. But when the ruble fell, the value of its debt increased enormously. And as the value of its debt increased enormously, it was placed in this very difficult position of having to pay back a larger and larger fraction of its GDP to the point, as I said, where where three-fourths of the income of the government were being spent on servicing the debt. As you visit Moldova, you see a country in the process of what I would call de-development, going back from cars to horses, streets marked by potholes, no lighting in the city. I was there in a period in which one of the friends of our group, daughter, had to go to the hospital. But the hospital ran out of oxygen. What is it to us, something we take for granted, the availability of oxygen in the hospital to them was an unaffordable luxury, and she died. So these are the kinds of consequences that are felt at the level of the individuals, of the countries, of the current system, which imposes enormous risk on those least able to bear it. 
matters are in some ways even worse because the way globalization has been managed not only has forced the developing countries to bear the lion's share of the risk of exchange rate and interest rate fluctuations, but has actually led to greater instability. The most important single factor, I believe, in contributing to the East Asia crisis, the ma major lesson of, of the class of 97, those who went through this crisis and asked the question, what, what caused the problem? was the fact that they had liberalized their capital markets too quickly. They were told by the U.S. Treasury and the IMF that they should allow short-term capital to move freely into their country. Before that, many of them had opened up their, their economies to foreign direct investment, foreign direct investment that brought with it access to markets, technology, training, but the speculative money was quite different. You can't build factories on the basis of money that can come in and out overnight. Some people said, open up your markets to short-term capital, and it will provide discipline. But the problem with this kind of discipline is it's the wrong kind of discipline. If you want discipline, you want somebody to discipline you with the same objective. The short-term speculators were not interested in long-term economic growth, the well-being of the citizens. They were not interested in increases of wages, low unemployment. They were interested in one thing, the returns in their capital in the next 30 days, 7 days, 24 hours. Moreover, these short-term capital markets are extraordinarily fickle. It may become a fad for everybody to go into some market, and then all of a sudden, it becomes a fad to go into somebody else. So capital can flow in and then flow out, leaving its wake enormous amount of uh, devastation. When it comes in, yes, there is economic growth, but the capital coming in isn't used to build factories. Too often it's used, if it's used at all, to fuel consumption boom. But when it leaves out, there isn't any capital, there hasn't been growth on which it's been based, and the country is left to pay the bill. This is what happened in East Asia, the part of the world, which didn't need the additional capital. After all, these countries were saving 30% of GDP, and some of the countries were saving even more than 30% of GDP. They were finding it a hard time to save all, to, to invest well all they were saving. They had no need to open up their market to these short-term, destabilizing, speculative money. But they were put under enormous pressure by the IMF and the U.S. Treasury to open up their markets. So while they didn't get very much benefit in terms of capital coming in, because they didn't need that extra capital, they paid an enormous price when the capital went out. One of the lessons is that countries need to be more prudent, more thoughtful in the pacing, sequencing when they open up their capital markets. For a country like the United States or for Western Europe, they have the institutions, the ability to, to withstand this kind of instability. But interestingly, even Europe grew far faster in the periods in which it did not have this kind of capital market liberalization. But Europe waited until well into several decades after World War II before it liberalized its capital markets. So it was well, well on the success of a successful, it was already a advanced industrial country. And yet the IMF and the U.S. Treasury put enormous pressure on these poor countries still at the early stages of the development where they're really not capable of standing the vicissitudes of these global financial short-term capital flows. Even advocates of capital market, like Paul Volcker, people who, who believe that, that capital markets can perform an important function, have recognized the enormous cost that they can, can bring about, and that developing countries need to be very careful 
in opening up their markets. A number of metaphors capture what went on in the late 90s and pr provide an important warning for other countries. They describe it as if you led a boat onto uh, uh, a rough sea before you trained the, uh, before you train, train the captain, before you made sure that there were, the ship was really seaworthy, before you equipped it with life rest to keep to, to protect people in the case of a storm. And what's worse, you let it out into the roughest part of the sea. Inevitably, no matter how well it was managed, it would have been hit by a side, by, by, by a wave from the side and to toppled over. That is like what, what was imposed on these countries. And then a, another metaphor talks about, about capital markets being like a road that, uh, and a car, that you, you gave these countries a souped up car with a strong engine before you checked the tires. And so you put your teenage son, before you trained him about how to drive, and he put his foot on the pedal before you checked that the brakes could work. Now some people said the solution is to make a wider road. But the real problem is to make a safer car. And when you see wrecks at a road, in the same place in the road, year after year, you have to come to the conclusion that the road was not well designed. You have to have cars and roads to be driven by mortals, by ordinary individuals, not by superhumans. And clearly, the global financial system, the way we've designed it, is not made to be handled by ordinary countries with ordinary leadership. And so that leads to the same, we have to change the system. We have to think about how we can make our global financial system work better. Now, of course, we would like it to be the case that we eliminate the sources of instability. We're never going to be able to do that. But what we can do is both reduce the degree of instability and make sure that the developing countries face less of the consequences and are better able to cope with the enormous instability that is, no matter how well we do, that is going to still be there. Well, what are some of the reforms that can make a difference? One of the reforms is changing the way we manage globalization, the global financial markets. One of the major themes that I've been emphasizing is that economic globalization is outpaced political globalization. We have central banks within each of our countries that try to manage the economy as a whole to stabilize the economy. We've become, as a world, very highly interdependent. But we don't have the global institutions to manage a globally interdependent economy. We can see that if we turn to one of the major sets of institutions that we have to try to iron out some of the problems, was called the G8, the leaders of the eight major countries of the world, the United States, uh, UK, Japan, Germany, uh, France, uh, eight countries get together to try to discuss mainly economic issues, but increasingly broadening out beyond the economic issues. But China's not invited, India's not invited, two countries that have close to 50% of the world's population. Now, in the last couple of years, the United States has been saying the major problem in global financial instability, the major problem is China's exchange rate and the instability that that gives rise to. Now, I believe the United States diagnosis is wrong. But whether it's right or wrong, the point is, how can you have a meaningful discussion about global instability 
arguing that China is the source of the problem and not have China a member of the club that makes the decision about what to do. Clearly, our institutions that we have today are not well suited for de dealing with the problems of a globally interdependent economy. Now, we do have one institution that was set up at the end of World War II, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund. Before World War II, there had been the Great Depression. Unemployment in the United States and Europe 20, reached 20, 25 percent. It was a major problem. World War II had lifted, uh, solved the problem of depression, but there was a worry by Keynes and by others that at the end of World War II, the world would slip back into recession. And so an international institution was founded, the IMF, to try to make sure that there was global stability. It was worried about some of the problems that had confronted the world in the late 20s and 30s. As each country saw its economy decline, it tried to lower its exchange rate. It was called competitive devaluation. It thought by lowering exchange rate, it could sell more, but of course, its gains were at the expense of other countries. So, just like today, the United States has been trying to lower its exchange rate, gaining more sales, but at the expense of Europe. And the point of the IMF, one of the point, uh, reasons for having the IMF was to try to stop this kind of competitive devaluation that was based on one country gaining at the expense of another. It was also founded on the basis of another Internet global problem, and that was that many countries needed to spend money to stimulate their economy. That was one of the Keynes' major insights, that spending money could help stimulate the economy and bring it out of a recession. And Keynes was one of the intellectual godfathers of the International Monetary Fund. But many countries did not have the ability to borrow to fund that kind of government spending. The IMF could lend money to countries to help them be able to stimulate their economy. It recognized that a weakness in one economy had consequences for another. It was like what we call an externality. A weak economy, one weak economy has consequences for others. If it is weak, it's not going to buy as much from others and that will hurt other economies. So it recognized early on that we are very interdependent and weaknesses in one part of the system are going to have consequences for the others. But unfortunately, when the IMF was established, one fundamental mistake was made. Governance of this institution was turned over to central banks and finance ministers. It was a natural decision. But unfortunately, finance ministers and central banks have a mindset which focuses mostly on financial markets and their interest, on bond markets and their interest. So its mindset was really focused on inflation, not on unemployment, not on economic growth. Keynes was aware of this kind of, kind of problem because in arguing for those policies of government spending to stimulate the economy, he had fought very strongly against those from financial markets who wanted to do just the opposite. President Hoover in the United States had pursued a strategy of responding to the economic recession, which had led to government deficits as government revenue went down, and said we ought to cut spending to get rid of the deficit and that will restore confidence. But of course, you can't restore confidence in an economy in a recession, a depression, when one out of four people are out of jobs. That is not going to, that's not going to work. And so the result of all of this was that there had been an enormous debate. And economic science had strongly come out in favor of Keynesian economics, the view that when you have an economic downturn, you need to stimulate the economy through lowering interest rates, spending more money, cutting taxes, even if that results 
in deficits. But with financial markets, with central bank governors, with finance ministers in charge, some of the old ways of thinking prevailed. And so what happened as time went on, you had the IMF focusing not on the problem of global financial stability, focusing not on the problem of unemployment, focusing not on the problem of helping the global economy grow, but focusing far more on the interest of the creditor countries and their financial institutions. The consequences have become apparent. For instance, one of the things that it did was to encourage countries to liberalize their capital markets, open up the capital markets to short-term capital flows. These destabilizing flows that were at the source of the instability of the crises in the late 90s. Ironically, in 1997, the IMF actually went to its annual meeting and asked for a change in its charter to allow it to force, to push countries around the world to liberalize their capital markets. I, I didn't understand. I was at the time chief economist of the World Bank. I asked the IMF, where's your evidence that this is going to promote economic growth? Before you make a major change like this, surely you must have evidence that this is going to be good for the countries. At the World Bank, we had done a number of studies which showed that it had led to more economic instability. Capital coming in, leading to a boom, capital going out, leading to an even worse downturn. They hadn't done the studies. They said, we know it's true. We don't need to, we don't, we don't need to see the proof. It was a matter of ideology. I think it was also a matter of interest. The financial markets made money when the capital moved in. The financial markets made money when the capital went out. The financial markets made money when there was a recession because as companies went bankrupt, they had to be restructured and the investment banks made money because they helped do the restructuring. So they made money whether there was success or whether there was failure. What was important to them was to have money moving and going back and forth. That was what they made the money from. So they were fundamentally reflecting the interest of these financial markets. And for them, evidence that it was good for the growth of developing countries was not necessary. Eventually, eventually, the IMF decided to look at the evidence. In the early years of the current decade, they did a study, and they came to the only conclusion that they could come that in many of the developing countries it did not produce economic growth, but it did produce economic instability. Too late for the countries that have been devastated. Too late for the countries that had borne the consequences of listening to their advice at the time. But at least they had the honesty of coming out with the right conclusion. As they wrote the report, they didn't understand. They said, this is against economic theory. But it wasn't against economic theory. It was against their economic theory. But their economic theory assumed markets were perfect and they worked perfectly. There was perfect information. But of course, anybody who understands markets understands that their markets are imperfect and that there is imperfect information. That's what they make money off of, after all. Anybody that understands financial markets knows that bankers like to lend to people who don't need it. And as soon as the countries showed that they needed the money, they wanted their money back. What should have been obvious to them came as a revelation and was inconsistent with their theory. To me, it was very painful because, in fact, progress in economic theory over the last quarter of century had focused exactly on this issue of how do markets work with imperfect information. We had shown that there was credit rationing. We had understood, come to understand so much better why it was that with imperfect information and these problems of imperfect capital markets, capital market liberalization would actually lead to more instability. So economic theory actually predicted what we observed. 
But the combination of ideology, old-fashioned economics, and special interests that led the IMF to push their particular agenda. Not only had they pushed this agenda, which had led to more instability, when the countries faced the consequences of these mistaken policies, again the IMF turned to ideology and the interest of that they reflected financial markets rather than the growth and well-being of the countries involved. Standard prescription, as I said before, for what you do when an economy goes into a downturn is to increase expenditures, cut taxes, lower interest rates, stimulate the economy. Even the United States under President Bush, a conservative, has adopted those policies in the early years of this decade as the American economy went into a recession. But in IMF economics, they did just the opposite. They raised interest rates. And when I say they raised interest rates, I really mean they raised interest rates. They have raised interest rates. In the case of Korea, they raised it from 9% to 25%. And the IMF came in and said, you can't be serious. You're not really serious about your problems. You have to let them go up to 40%. In the case of Indonesia, Interest rates were already at the level of 20%, and they let them said you have to raise them to 40% or 80%. Well, no wonder when you raise interest rates to those levels, you have an economic downturn. Even well-managed companies were forced into bankruptcy. The number of firms in bankruptcy, and in the case of Indonesia, the number of comp companies that were unable to make their debt obligations rose to 75%. In the case of Korea, rose to 50%. And with so many countries in default, no one, companies in default, no wonder the economy plummeted. With the economy plummeted, no, matter, no wonder that people took their money out of their country. With, money taking, with people taking their money out of the country, no wonder that the exchange rate plummeted even more. And so rather than providing a stabilizing force for the economy, the IMF prescriptions exacerbated the economic crisis and made it deeper. Slowdowns were turned into recessions, recessions were turned into depressions. The economic downturn in Indonesia became much worse than it otherwise would have been. The downturn in one country made matters worse than the neighboring countries. As each country buys from the other goods, when it's when one economy went down, it bought less from the other, from its neighbors. And so the whole region sank into a recession and depression. At one point, the U.S. Treasury objected strongly to anybody even using the word recession or depression. They, they said, don't use the R word or the D word, as if by not talking about it, the problem would go away. But the policies that the U.S. Treasury and the IMF had pushed was what made the downturns so severe. And only by talking about it could you actually reverse the problem. Recognizing the problem, could you reverse it and get the economies going? In fact, in the midst of this 1997, Japan made an extremely, extraordinarily generous offer of $100 billion to fund the uh,